two, one. We are live. All right. We did it. Technology. We are live with, please take your seats. We are live with Mal Cooper. Hey, everyone. There we go. That's good. That's good. More and more. Of people. people everywhere. You can't swing a dead cat. <laughs> we have 72 people here today. Awesome. You are live. We do I need an intro? Or oh, I just go? That's what we're doing here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is it. We, we do not have your slides up because on the screen, it's it's you. Okay. Yeah, I didn't. I actually didn't send you my slides because I tried to do this with my slides on the screen, and I kept getting distracted. So I'm just gonna. My slides are for me for my notes, and I'm just gonna yammer at the rest of you, um, and you'll have to hear from there. So hopefully, you guys all know who I am. Um, I had the homework of watching my video, so um, hopefully that uh, that is, was enough to get you guys started. I was thinking a bunch today about what to talk about, and, and actually the last couple of days, and, and solicited some information from you. And people were interested in a couple of things: um, an expansion on on the um, the how to build your reach, and also on how Jill and I went from ten thousand dollars to a million dollars in three years. Um, and that was something that happened as we as we expanded, as we basically as we just wrote a lot of books. But there was more to it than that, and I wanted to kind of get into that, and then talk to you guys about how. Um, we built out our reach and built a larger reach um, of, of readers to be able to do that sort of thing. And now I just see myself. I hope you're all still there. Um, I'm going to assume that everybody's still there and keep talking, but I have this terrible fear now that you're not. But anyway, so what I want to talk about is how we first started out and how those first four years went and how things weren't working for those first four years and then how we improved that and, um, and went on from there. So initially, I, re I released my first book in 2012, and it was actually a, um, uh, a prequel. I'd written the, what, what eventually became the fourth book first, and I decided to, release my, to write a prequel to that because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I released that, and it did basically nothing. Um, that book came out in 2012, and... Am I still here? I don't know what just happened. What happened, Craig? What'd you do, Craig? Why the hell? Okay. Did you guys just hear everything I just said? Yes. Okay, good. I had no idea if I'm talking to myself. All I could see was myself. I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. And but I was kind of unnerved. I'm like, am I going to have to say all this what? over again? I'm going to forget everything I just said. You're you fine. See, right? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. So um, I feel better seeing you guys. It's much, much better. It's nice. All right. So um, yeah, so that first book did nothing and I did all the things wrong. And I I've talked about that before, about how I use bloggers and we and I screwed up my also bots and whatnot. But I kept soldiering on and I wrote the second book and I screwed that up too because um, in my first book that I wrote, I had this really fast paced story. It was like Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was action, small interlude, action, small interlude, action. Um, and then when I, and like the, the interludes were like, like in Raiders Lost Ark when all you have is just the, um, you know, just the red dot with the airplane sounds going. Like I was like really light on anything that happened between action scenes. And then in my second book, I'm like, I'm going to do this, this sort of like this deep space thing. Where everybody's going to be really like alone and sad and lonely and stuff like that. And it turned out that was a terrible idea because after you write this really action packed book and you try and write this other book where, where you, where you explore this different feel, um, it does the readers just aren't interested in that. You set an expectation, then you screwed that up. So I learned that, that was a bad thing to do. Um, and I also screwed up the length of the books too. It was like 110K, 70K, 120K, and readers weren't really used to, they weren't sure if they're getting full books from me or shorter novels, um, and I messed all that up too. But um, I did learn a lot about what not to do, and what Jill and I figured out in, in um, 2016, this was June of 2016 after we released book three, was that three three books was kind of the magic number. And we did a bit of work to re-edit those books and to square some things away and then started advertising those books and things actually started going kind of well. We went for, around June of 2016 was when we had made about $10,000 all told between the two of us. And that was over three years with a book bub in the mix for Jill. Um, 
I guess three and a half years is what it, what it really worked out to. And we had maybe sold like, you know, like maybe a couple thousand books between, between the both of us um, at, at best. And she had sold way more than I had at that point, but we started advertising my books and we started doing some ads that were kind of um, obnoxious and they kind of worked. So one of them was, um, was is, is, is Michael, is MD Cooper the next Larry Niven? And Larry Niven's a popular um, science fiction author. And most of the responses on that particular ad were no. Um, that's what people had to say about that. But it was, it was an interesting experience because we started to get a lot of readers. Um, and in, June, in November of 2016, um, things were actually starting to go really well. In fact, that's actually when I published the fourth book. And that fourth book was actually the first book I wrote I had just um, decided to release the prequels ahead of time. I decided rather than being George Lucas, I would do everything in the correct order. And so readers could actually read things properly. And I actually published that fourth book on stage at 20 books, um, 2017 in Vegas. And, um, and that was sort of like a, a cool thing to do. And I made $25,000 that month, um, that November. And I remember thinking to myself that basically, like, I don't know why I'm making this much money. <laughs> it's kind of what I was thinking. I had this fear that um, that Amazon had made a mistake, and that these book sales weren't really real, and that um, that I was going to uh, wake up one day and Amazon was going to send an email and say, "Oops, <laughs> you know, those these were Michael Anderley sales or something like that. We didn't mean to attribute these to your books. Um, you're screwed." Um, you know, so I, I kind of had that fear and. Um, and I knew that I had to somehow become the master of my own destiny and not really trust any sort of, of, of random act of God from Amazon or, or an algorithm or being sticky or something like that to, to propel me. Um, and I also knew that I wanted to quit my day job and, and start writing full time. So um, with lots of careful planning, uh, I quit my day job with at that like only two months later and then didn't release a book for another four months, um, which was was because mainly at that time, I didn't think I could actually write books that quickly. And um, I had though done very well with Facebook advertising. I don't want to belabor that too much because I've done so many talks on that. And you guys can all get the book for free. The um, the second edition of my Facebook ads book that I just released, you, I put a link in the in the groups, you can pick that up for free. And that talks a lot about how I how I use ads to, um, to, to get going and how Jill did a lot of the initial work to do that as well. And um, but then after that, it was a lot of it was around how are we going to find more readers organically and not spend a lot of money? Because I'm a very firm believer that you shouldn't spend more than 20 to 25 percent of your of your income on advertising. If your marketing budget goes over 25 percent, then you're doing something wrong. Um, your marketing bar budget, unless you're doing some sort of major promo with specific goals, you shouldn't really get much over much over 25 percent. Um, and I want to try and do things that would bring bring in. Um, new readers and sell more books without spending a lot more money on marketing and also because um i didn't want to saturate the audience i didn't know how big the audience was out there for what i was doing and i didn't want to just spam them with my ads all the time i wanted to sort of have a nice slow build and and keep showing my ads to new people and show my ads to existing people but not hit them too much so i didn't want to make my marketing budget too big i wanted to want to sort of try and dole that out so what i did um in late 2016 that ended up paying dividends and kept me alive for those six months between I published two, when I published book four and when I published book five or my fourth book and my fifth book was I took book one and I built an, uh, an, a one through three and I made an omnibus edition. And I actually kind of did what, what I typically don't recommend now. I made an omnibus edition the moment I released the, uh, the third book almost. And I did that because I wanted to be able to market both my first book and the omnibus um, first book. I wanted to make sure that I could always be marketing two things. And I also did a thing where I said I, I knew in my particular genre in science fiction that a lot of historically a lot of the covers feature characters and a lot of the covers feature spaceships. When I refer to spaceship ass, um, I wanted and I, I I knew that there was that there was sort of like an iconic imagery that would capture people the same way that like you know iconic imagery like Manchester captures for romance readers and some big guy with a sword is like your iconic um, fantasy cover and whatnot. A big starship with big honking engines is sort of the the science fiction version of that. But also a lot of science fiction books historically have always featured characters. So what I did is I made sure that my omnibus editions would always feature um, one type of cover and my individual books would feature another type of cover and then I could actually market them to different people and use different types of blurbs as well. So for my 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 books that are, are showing more of a a starship, what I would do is I would always market more plot-based blurbs with those. And my my books that my book covers that showed a character, I would market more character-based blurbs with those and character-based descriptions on the ads and whatnot. And that way I could actually hit different targets with the same book 
was showing two different covers effectively because one was the omnibus and one was a standalone and then also have different types of blurbs selling those types of books and do tests and whatnot and see which sort of blurb is working better. Um, but I knew that at that point I thought I could only write three or four books a year. And like, for example, in 2018, I did 44 books. So I've done, I've done a little bit better than that. But at that point I didn't initially know I could do that. And I thought, okay, I want to write like at least a 12 to 16 book series. I'm going to run out of clever ways to market this first book. If it's all the, if it's the only first book I'm going to have for, you know, for two to three years. Um, Cause I write a very linear story. So you have to read the whole thing in order to get it. Um, so what I ended up doing as well is I, I looked at that, the, the fourth book, the one that I had actually published in November of 2017. And that was actually, like I said, the first book that I wrote. And I said, you know, I wrote this book to be an, a, for a book one. It has like the sort of a slower build intros, characters and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and it was a good starting point as well for the story. So I actually took that and instead of having it be book four in, in the series, I actually made it a new series. I cha changed it to book one and it became a new series. And then I suddenly had, um, with only four books published, I now had three books that I could market and I could, I could pull readers into and I, and they had different styles of covers and they had different blurbs and they were, they were, you know, the, the, the first book I published back in 2012 was a much more military book. And the book that um, came out in November of 2016 was more of a um, uh, space Western, like kind of like a firefly type story. And so I was actually able to hit different targets with those as well, even though they would, the, the readers from one would flow into the other, it was a way to capture more readers and to market to a broader group of people by, by, by making it so the book appeared to appeal to a different demographic um, than my other books. And then that, what that then gave me is, uh, like I said, I had three books. And then I did a, another thing in, um, in April of 2017, I took book one and book two and I took some short stories and some stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor. And I added that in and I made an extended edition of book one and two that I sold as well. And then <laughs> it keeps going. A couple of months later, I actually made a different extended edition of that book. And I bundled it together with a music album that um, Sonata and Scribe had done. Sonata and Scribe actually will, will read your book and produce a music album to go along with your book. And that music album was um, you get the CD and that special book, which had a special cover um, that you could only get if you bought that book. And it was $75. And I think I sold about five or $6,000 worth of those. So these were all different ways that I could produce different content all off of this first book and, and sell it multiple times to my big fans and use it to capture new people in new ways. And I did that again, because I wasn't sure how many books I could write. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I had, I, I had new things I could market all the market all the time. And I could show those new things to new people in new ways. You know, I could have stuff on Spotify. I could have stuff on, on Amazon music. I could be selling CDs on Etsy and stuff like that. So it was a way for me to, um, to continue to branch out and have more content available all off of all by reusing that, that first book. Um, so there's another thing that I ended up doing in 20, in early 2017, that, um, that really helped propel things along a lot. And it's also it did two things that one caused me to realize that I really didn't want to rely on other people to sell my books. And two, it also helped me. So when a lot of people tell you the stories of how they sold books, and um, and what really gave them a big a big boost? They don't tell you about the lightning strikes. They kind of leave those out because it doesn't make it look like you know what you're doing as much. If you're like, and then lightning struck, and it was amazing, and I don't know what happened. You know that doesn't really work for a great talk. People want to know what actually happened. But there were two lightning strikes that happened in early 2017 that I think are worth noting. Uh, one of them is that I got a book bub for that omnibus that I wrote, and um, this was back when you could actually um, run a Kindle countdown deal. And Amazon was was very good about about making about promoting the even if the Kindle countdown deal was present, um, P KU buyers only saw the KU button, and you got good reads for if they bought on KU. So the Kindle countdown deals I had at ninety nine cents. It doesn't seem to be that way now. It seems to be like either the KU the KU folks all buy because they realize they can, um, and they become more savvy, or the button doesn't show as much. I'm not sure exactly what what it is, but it used to be back then that if you ran a, a book bub and you had a book in KU, you were going to make ten thousand dollars easy. Um, if it was an omnibus and I made $18,000 off of that, um, that book bub that I ran for that omnibus edition. And that was really, you know, quite useful. But the interesting thing is that not a lot of those readers read through once they finished the omnibus. And that was, and that's something that has become more and more, uh, prevalent with book bub is that the, the book bub has basically trained a lot of people to simply just be bargain hounds. And they're not really people that are, are looking to spend a lot more money. And I don't really like discounting by books that much. So once they finished that 99 cent omnibus and the next book was $5, most of them just didn't read on, but enough of them did. 
Um, and the KU people that you that I captured did as well, because in KU, obviously, they don't care what 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 the next book costs, and they you know the price point wasn't a big deal for them with BookBub. It was just simply that they saw it. Um, and then shortly after that BookBub, that Omnibus got put into Prime Reading, um, and Prime Reading kept it. You know, Prime Reading. Doesn't, usually you don't see a lot of sales from Prime Reading, but, but back then you would get really good rank from Prime Reading. And um, and that book then stayed in the top 10, usually in the top three um, science fiction anthologies from about, I want to say it was, it was sometime in late March all the way up until almost December of 2017. And, um, and that was a huge driver. And that was something that um, I don't know that I could orchestrate that again in the future, but I've been trying to ever since. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the things I've tried to do to try and like, you know, not have to rely on BookBub and Amazon doing these things, but be able to create this own sort of scenario all on my own. Um, and then also at the, at, as, as 2017 went on, I realized that I could write books a lot faster. And, um, and I should actually mention that in April of 2017, my sales had dropped from 25,000 to just around 15,000. Um, I think actually, I think it might've bottomed out close to $12,000 a month which doesn't seem like that much, but where I live in Boston, um, you can't you can't survive on anything less than six. And if you consider the government's taking a whole lot of that already and you have to pay for covers and edits and whatnot, it was it was getting pretty scary. And I actually spent a lot of, a lot of 2017 kind of living in terror. And I think a lot of authors who, who have made it um, or authors who have, um, who have who have gone full time will tell you that for the first while they're pretty damn scared that it's all just going to evaporate on them and they're going to be they're going to have to you know eat crow and go back to their old job and ask for the job back or something like that or at least tell your family like yeah I did that author thing and it didn't work because I think for a lot of us like at least for me my family said you could never make a living of being a writer and when I finally could I'm like yeah screw you I was able to be make a living being a writer and I really didn't want to have to have my brothers mock me incessantly for. For failing at that that was a fear is a really good motivator and fear kind of kept me going through a lot of 2017 um but what i did realize as i had done all these different experiments basically reselling my first book in a bunch of different ways was that the, the power was really going to be in the backlist if i could build this big backlist it was going to give me more and more things to market and i could more i could kind of casually market all of these things and i'm at the point right now where i have 24 different series and I can actually rotate through which book ones I'm currently marketing. Um, so I'm not always marketing all of my book ones even anymore. I'm only usually marketing about five or six um, different book ones, launching different series, but I'll rotate them around. Or maybe I'll take a particular book one and I'll market it really heavy in the US. And then when I kind of, when, I, when, my, when my ads for that one don't work as well anymore, I run out of ideas. I just take the exact same ads I was running in the US and I run them in Canada, the UK and Australia. Um, and I let those let them percolate that way for a while, and then I fire up some new ads for the U.S. for a different series. So having a really big, big um, backlist has allowed me to do that. And throughout 2017, I brought on four co-authors, one of them being my wife, and then two, and then three others, and was able to bring myself up to the. And I should say, by the way, if you don't know, everything I write is in one universe. I think I mentioned that in the Vegas talk. Um, so and I did that on purpose because I wanted to make sure that no matter what I wrote, whatever, no matter what I marketed. Um, I was going to get the read through into the rest of my books. And it's not perfect. There are people like I even see them in my fan group, like, well, I'm just reading the main series, I'm not reading the spin-offs now. Or some people are like, I love side quests, and they go and read everything and they have a grand old time um, with all those stories. But um I did I did want to make sure that every time I released a new series, I wouldn't have to push it really hard because I was going to get at least my core readers will go off and to read that new series, even without me doing any marketing. Um and that was that was something that that I felt was going to be was going to be a really powerful driver. And I have, as it turns out now, about ten thousand really hardcore readers who will read everything that I write. Um, and if you think about like having ten thousand readers, if you make like let's just say you make two dollars a book and you have ten thousand readers, if you could release a book every three months, you're talking you know forty thousand dollars every three months off of those ten thousand readers. Now they're not all going to read everything you know the month that comes out, and some of them are going to be behind. But you can actually make a very good living. Off of off of ten thousand readers, if you can if you can produce books uh, regular regularly, um, and as as twenty seventeen rolled on, I realized that I wanted to more and more produce um, produce a lot of books and build up a really big backlog for myself. I'm just going to quickly check my notes to see if I didn't miss miss anything. Uh, let's see, all the things I did wrong. <laughs> yep, that's that's I, I covered all the things I did wrong. Oh, the other thing actually I did want to mention um, is that. Between 2012 and 2016, I treated writing like a hobby, but I wanted it to pay me like a job. 
And that was something that um, that was a mindset issue that I had to correct myself on. And I think a lot of people make that mistake as well. They they say, well, like, you know, I want I want writing to take off and do amazing things for me, but you're not treating it like a job. You're just treating it like a hobby. You're not like building that newsletter. You're not setting expectations with your readers about when the next books are coming out. You're not marketing the next books. You're not thinking about pre-orders and deadlines and, you know, when, when your editor is going to be available and having your cover in advance and stuff like that. So I think it is really important if you're still starting out and you want your book to become your business, you have to treat it like a business before it's a business and not treat it like a hobby. So I think that's something that's, um, well, that looks really good. What are you guys having there? It's delicious. <laughs> 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 I'm intrigued. All right, so that's, that was just one one of the note about about a mistake that I made in 2016. I sort of like it, or before 2016, I wanted things to magically just work out for me, um, but I wasn't treating it like something was like a, like it was going to work out for me. The other thing that I, that I did um, come in the end of 2017 is I set for myself uh, what's called a, a bag, a big hairy audacious goal. And the goal that I set for myself, I mentioned it before, is I want to have 500 books by 2030. Um, I want to create the largest um, contiguous science fiction universe ever made, even bigger than Michael Landerly's. That's that's my goal. Like I'm like done it for. He's ahead of me right now, but you know, I'm gonna keep going. Um, and and as 2017 rolled on, and I did did 24 books, when I thought I might do four or five, I realized I could actually do something like this. I could create a massive series. Um, but I knew that I from, from past experience, you know, doing software development, that I had to actually have smaller, more measurable goals because. Um, if you just have like this one massive goal and you point yourself toward it and it's like a 10 year goal, you're going to get really dismayed partway through that journey. You need to have smaller measurable um, goals that you can meet along the way. So I set smaller goals and I, sometimes I've met them and sometimes I've missed them. Um, but I set those because I wanted to have milestones that I could hit and I could have celebrations and I could feel good about doing stuff. Um, but some of the other goals I set for myself it, weren't just number of books or amount of money. It was more around my process. Like, could I write books faster and have those books also be better? Um, could I do less revisions? Could I could I sit down and write a book in a week and have that be a really good book? And uh, that's something I worked on a lot. And and um, I think I've actually achieved that. Like in, and so 2018 went insane. I did 44 books in 2018. Um, over half of them I wrote solo. And even my co-authored books, I usually would spend about 60 to 80 hours on a co-authored book. Um, in August of August of 2018 will be forever burned into my mind as a thing that I never want to do again. I wrote 250,000 words in August of 2018. I edited um, and revised 100,000 words of co-author books and I went to Disney World for a week. So you can imagine I wasn't a lot of fun to be around <laughs> in August of 2018. And, um, and, and, and a realization I came to at that point as well was that I don't didn't want to have to keep working that hard. Um, and I was up around forty-five thousand dollars a month at the at the high point of last year. But I thought, you know, here I am working my tail off. I've got, you know, at that point I, I was closing in on on sixty books. Um, but I wasn't making that much more money than I was in twenty sixteen. You know, twenty sixteen I was making twenty-five thousand dollars a month with four books. Now the the market has changed a lot, where there's a lot more books and there's a lot more authors. So it is harder to sort of have books that can stay. Um, buoyant for a really long time because there's so much other stuff coming out now that there's always other people marketing other things and it's harder to be the you know the the, the part of a smaller number of number of books that were really capturing people's vision um, but I knew that I, I wanted to figure out a way where I could produce fewer books um, not killing myself but still make a good decent wage and that's really what I focused on in in, uh, in 2019 and one of the things that I tried doing in 2019 to find more readers was I tried going wide and for me, that actually didn't work. Um, and it didn't work because I couldn't sell books wide. It didn't work because my Amazon sales dropped a lot more than I expected. Um, I took about 30 of my books wide and I was actually able to make more money off of those 30 books wide um, plus Amazon sales than I was when they were in Amazon with KU. But the problem that happened for me was because all of my books were in the same universe. KU readers would look at my 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 library and say, oh, only only half the books are in KU and I only read in KU. So KU readers started to fall off on the books that I had left in Amazon. And I saw a really precipitous drop um, in my in my earnings happen because of that. And I tried for about four months to, to make it up and eventually I put everything back in Amazon. But that was something that, that um, did actually help in some respects because I did actually capture a lot of readers and then bring them um, over to Amazon for better or for worse. So I might regret that in a year or two, <laughs> but, but for, for now it was what I had to do. Um, and the other thing that I that I did is I did a lot more work with um, with omnibuses. 
um, or box sets. I like calling them omnibuses because the OCD in me doesn't like calling them a box when there's no box. But um, my, my peculiarities aside, um, I did a lot more work with taking taking um, sections of books and box and putting them to omnibuses and then turning those omnibuses into series. And there's actually a number of authors that are doing that now where they'll actually take um, disparate sets of books and they'll actually build a series out of them in omnibuses and then resell those omnibuses. And those things do great in KU. And if you run sales on them and you can you can bring them up in rank, you can actually um, start, start a lot of KU steam running for those. So for example, um, December, we had, a, we had a big dip, Jill and I, this summer because um, I actually only released two novellas all summer long. And um, I don't think she released anything this summer either now that I think about it. So we had a pretty big dip. We went all the way back down to $15,000 a month again. But now we're back up at $25,000 a month. Um, and we didn't actually do very many major releases between then and now. I think I've only released four books um, since August, um, which is pretty low, you know, low for me when last year I was releasing four books a month. Um, and what, what we really did to help with that is taking older series and bundling them into complete series omnibuses. And so I had done that once before, and that's actually what, what I think had been one of the big things with that first series I did back in 2016, is I called it the Complete Intrepid Saga. Um, and I was able to take that, and, and a lot of readers would buy that because of that. So I took one of my series just this December, for example, um, Rika's Marauders, and the last book in that in that series actually came out in January of this year of 2019. But I, so it's actually been it's been almost a year since that series wrapped up. But I took the whole thing, seven books, and I put it into one omnibus. And that those books separately sell for about thirty two, thirty four dollars if you were to buy all seven books individually. But I took them, put them all in an omnibus, and I sold that for ninety nine cents, which I actually had not ever quite done that before because I was always a little bit nervous about taking that much that that many books and selling them for that little. But I said, you know what? It's it's been a year since that something's come out. I have a follow on series with the same characters, so that even if um, I end up like you know gut, gutting my sales of that first series, everybody that at least picks it up is going to go on and read the next series. But my hope was that I would end up sort of getting enough rank and enough enough popularity going that I could reach a new group of readers who had not yet picked up my books because this particular series was um, in appearance looks a lot different than my other books. It falls more of a ground pounding um, uh, on the ground soldier type of series where a lot of my other stuff is all spaceships and space opera. This was much more military science fiction on the ground. And I was hoping I could get more military sci-fi readers with this series. And by taking it and, and offering seven books for, for $1, I was actually able to reach out and grab about another um, 7,000 new readers. Um, and that's based on the fact that based on the sales of the individual books before and also cutting out probably about 3,000 sales for people that I figured were just picking up the whole thing because because they like me and stuff like that. So I, I managed to grab 7,000 new readers who, who, who either had not read very many of my books before or had not read any of my books before and suck them in into this, this new series. Um, and on top of that, what I was really hoping would happen did happen, that the KU um, ball started rolling. And this series, this, this omnibus edition right now is now making about uh, 100 to $200 a day just in KU reads. And on top of that, the standalone books really haven't dropped off that much. So I just sort of out of thin air took a, took a created an omnibus and did a little bit of marketing for it and managed to pull an extra $200 a day off of that. Um, and in addition, I also did a really big giveaway surrounding it where people could actually win uh, a Kindle with all of my books preloaded onto it and some other swag and stuff like that, and managed to pull in, I think, at least 1,500 new email addresses um, by doing that giveaway as well. So, um, so that was a great way to take existing content that I already had and then remarket that and reach a whole, a whole new group of readers. Um, that's something that you can do when you have a large um, library, but it's not something you can do when you have a few books. So that whole axiom of build your backlist really does matter. It gives you so many more options about uh, for how you can how you can market new things you can do to sell and also means that whenever you bring a reader in, if your backlist is well interconnected you'll actually and, and you can get them to read all of your books you'll do really well um, another thing that i've been working on a bunch this year is trying to do more more reader outreach and i talked a lot about that um at the yeah. um the presentation in vegas but something that i've done that I'm, that I'm doubling down on again now is doing more stuff with patreon I don't know if any, if any of you guys um, use Patreon, but it's a way that you can actually create sort of a subscription where people pay you every month and you give them some type of content. Um, I give short stories, I give art. Um, they get some of my books for free um, if they if they sign up on Patreon. People who buy my people, I have some people pay me $10 a month and every year I send them a signed book. And I have some people that actually pay me $50 a month on Patreon. And I actually send them a signed book every single month. 
Um, cause both, I mean, books only cost about five or $6 from, from KDP. So they don't cost that much to do that. And so some of my, some of you who just want to make sure they always have my latest books in print, um, paid me that $50 a month and they actually get, they, they get the, the book sent to them. There's not that many of them. There's, there's usually only about four or five, but I mean, four or five people paying you $50 a month is, um, is a pretty nice bit of money. But another thing that I realized I could do is I'm a chatty Kathy. I'm always on Facebook chatting with people. Like if I don't have like three or four Facebook messenger chats going at once, it's a weird day. Um, I don't know how I write at all. I'm constantly just like chatting with people and writing books at the same time. But um, I realized if I'm going to be doing all this chatting all the time, I should just be chatting with my fans and taking all that energy and putting it into putting into building up more community with my fans. And I already have a fairly active Facebook group. I have um, about 700, maybe 750 people in my Facebook group, but they post more than I do. They post about four or five times a day. Um, and I maybe post two or three times a week. So they really keep the group going. Um, but I wanted more ways to interact with them. So I started using this thing called Discord. And Discord is a, um, a chat system for top for, it actually started out for gamers, but now a lot of other people use it for other things. And you can do voice chat and, and type um, typing chat. And it now has about 300 million um, users. So it's um, it's pretty far up there. It's, it's not as, as popular as Reddit, because Reddit right now I think is 1.2 billion users, but it's climbing really fast. And the neat thing about it is like, I, a lot of my, my readers, like they're using Discord to um, to, to chat with friends, they're using what well, they're playing The Sims, they're playing World of Warcraft, who knows what they're doing, but they could be playing one of these games. And because Discord is a lot like Facebook, where you create a new server, but a server is really not much different than a group in Facebook or something like that. So you create a new server and people can join your server and chat with you. But then if they're playing The Sims and talking with their friends, I can put up an announcement and, um, and they're going to be like playing The Sims and suddenly see an announcement in Discord that I've got like a new cover reveal or I'm going to be doing a voice chat or something like that. And I can kind of reach out to them and grab them as they're doing different things. Um, that might not work for everybody's genre, but there are a lot of you know tools and systems that, that, that your readers might be using to hang out. Like if you're writing lit RPG, you can guarantee that those guys are on Discord. Um, if you're writing you know fantasy, a lot of fantasy readers are going to be on Discord because they might be playing fantasy games like Dragon Age or something like that, and they might be on Discord hanging out with their friends. So it's another way that you can you can uh, reach out to people. And but the great thing with Discord is it ties into Patreon, and with Patreon you you, you have like all these different tiers that you can do, and I can actually give um, my Discord users special privileges based on what how much money they're paying me in Patreon. So it's another way to give my my loyal fans. What I was talking about in my Vegas talk about finding your super fans and rewarding them. It's another way I can take my super fans and give them special rewards and special recognition amongst my readers, which is a thing that that they really like too. You know, they love having their names in the front of the book and whatnot, but they love being in Discord and being like having one of the special ranks and give them a special color and privileges and stuff like that in Discord. And I'm also doing a thing where I'm actually doing voice chats with them. And the Discord users have special chats and special channels that only they get access to. So I can actually speak with them in real time. So that's another way that I'm taking sort of in many ways existing content that I already have. And I'm leveraging it to take those to, to take those super fans and market to them. And then also I'm using it to help branch out because these people are actually inviting their friends into my Discord server. So they're just like, you know, they don't just people who don't read my books are coming in because their friends read my books and they say, come hang out here and talk about this series or talk about sci-fi and stuff like that. So it's another way to just sort of market out of the blue to people that I would never have talked talk to before. And that's and also it's all doing um, word of mouth marketing, which is the best. So that's something to, to keep in mind, too, if that would work for your for your genre. Um, or if not, I'm actually I'm getting close to running out of time, about 13 minutes left. All right. So. Um, so that's and that's actually that's a really big thing that I think is really important as you start as you as you do better and you start writing more or you want to work less and keep making more money is you really want to think of ways to diversify your income streams. When I mentioned at the very beginning um, about how we made one million dollars since 2016, we actually made 1.25 million dollars since since 2016, but one million was in a one KDP account and the other quarter million dollars was spread out across other things that we were doing, you know, doing audio. Um, selling print books. I sell print books, signed print books on Etsy as well. And those signed print books, um, one month I made $2,000 selling signed print books on Etsy. And I know it's not quite as easy a thing for you guys to do because um, it's probably pretty expensive to ship books from Australia all over the world. In fact, I would say it's prohibitively expensive, but you never know. You make a little team up with an author in the US and, um, and get them to do something like that to, to help you with that. Um, or you might be able to do things where you could um, send out um, uh, signed book placards and stuff like that. But there's a lot of other ways of, of doing that sort of thing. And the final thing I wanted to mention is that if you can create interesting characters in your books that are fun and quirky, 
you can actually make a lot of money selling merchandise for those characters. We have this one series where we just, on book four, we introduced this cat named Mr. Fizzlepop. And Mr. Fizzlepop can talk, but he's not much smarter than a regular cat. So he call, he, he, whenever he's in the books, he's talking, he's all caps all the time. And he calls everybody asshole because we're pretty sure that's what cats would just say to everybody. Um, and he's always, he's always basically demands pizza and tuna for everything that he does. And so we just started making coffee cups with all sorts of Mr. Fizzlepop sayings on them. And uh, we use this service called Printful and Printful connects to Etsy. So someone can go onto our Etsy store, see the Mr. Fizzlepop cups, order them. Printful fulfills the order, ships it directly to the customer and Printful ships from the from Europe and fr from Europe, Mexico and the United States. So they can cover a lot of a lot of readers that way. Um, and I don't have to do anything. We don't have to, we don't have to warehouse any cups. There's no inventory. Um, we don't have to worry about, about anything. It's just all happens automatically. And we actually make, sometimes we make more money off of those coffee cups than we do off that entire series. Um, because we actually make like $4 a cup and we only make two seventy dollars a book. So it's an interesting way to make, to take something that, you know, that we were already selling these books and we already had, you know, we invented this cat and to start selling more merchandise around them to the point where we've actually now introduced a number of animals because we want to sort of maximize this. We've got a lot of quirky animals now showing up across the books because we actually want to make merch for them. And, and these, these animals will actually sometimes make more money than the actual books will. So it's, it's another way to diversify your income and to make sure that you have additional income streams. And it's been especially useful because I basically burned myself out in 2018, um, as you can imagine. And, and that um, coming out of transgender, um, traveling three months of the year in 2019, going to different events and whatnot, and also just kind of just being semi burnt out caused me to produce, I think we've only written the entire AM14 group has only written like 17 books in 2019, but we made, you know, we made a quarter million dollars. Oh, 10 minutes. Thank you, Craig. So that was, that was the other thing is that, is that you can use these different ways to find new readers. You can, you can go where interesting technologies are, are, are happening. Um, you can even do things like going to, um, and I've, I have some author friends who have done this. I haven't done it myself yet, but all the towns around where I live, they do farmer's markets all summer long. And lots of these authors actually set up stands at the farmer's markets and sell their books. I see them there all the time. And that's another way to get out in front of people that you might not be in front of before. Talk to them, do that stuff I talked about before, about hand selling, where you're holding your book and you're trying to pitch someone, you're reading, you're looking in their eyes and seeing what they think of what you're saying. You can do that at farmer's markets. You can do that at bookstores. You can do that at um, libraries that do allow you to do readings. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do that sort of thing too, and and to reach new readers as well. That's not as effective as finding a large volume of readers, but it's a great way to to tune what you're doing and to see what's working and what's not working. So, all right, that was a lot of stuff in a short period of time, and I wanted to have some time for questions. So hopefully, um, you guys have some. <laughs> that's the roving computer. No questions at all. I'd say it's like a baby, but it's more like the uh, Total Recall alien. <laughs> oh dear, I can just visualize this now. All right, so I see a hand. Just ask. Me. Are, Mal, the question was, are you still doing music and books together? Yes. Um, 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 I suddenly forgot his name. Nick from Son and Scribe is doing another album for me. The problem with this is that Nick is like engrossed in reading all of my books right now and keeps wanting to do <laughs> new songs for them. And I'm like, come on, finish the album already. But I think he's done nine songs now. Um, and he's just about done. And I'll be releasing that second album probably in a couple of, probably a couple months. Um, and I'll have that out as well. And that one I'm going to do um, an omnibus for. And actually another thing I'm doing is this um, February, I'm going to do a Kickstarter my goal is to raise twelve thousand dollars to narrate an entire series all at once, and I'm actually going to that's going to take that same seven book series I had before and release that as one um, audiobook. So people are going to snatch that up because people you know, audiobook listeners love it when they can use one credit to get them. It's going to be like something like sixty five hours of narration, and they're going to be able to spend one credit to get that. So my hope is I'm going to be able to take that and and get a whole lot more people to buy that on Audible. But on the in addition, I've worked out a deal with my narrator where I'll actually be able to get the thing narrated for about $9,000. And my goal is to actually make $12,000 off Kickstarter. And based on what I've seen other people do, like Michael Scott Earl made $40,000 off of his last Kickstarter for an audiobook. So I'm pretty sure I can do 12. So I stand a pretty good chance actually of paying for this whole narration, getting some profit and then selling it on Audible and doing really well there as well. So 
that's something else around around the, sort of the whole audio area and and thing like and and to pair with that, I'm actually giving uh, bigger backers things like leather bound books and stuff like that. So if you if you back for like fifty dollars or a hundred dollars, I'm actually gonna provide like leather bound books and special hardcovers and um, other merch and stuff like that for people that are doing the backing. And, and apparently, I've not done this myself yet for books, but apparently, you actually get a lot of people who just love to back things on Kickstarter who are not currently your readers will actually also go and back your book. So it's another way to actually capture new people and and get paid doing it. So I'm pretty excited about that. Anything else? No, you guys are just. Oh. markets or anything smaller. Do you um, wear something in particular, like you were saying, your branding and to catch up with your cat suit? What would you do at something smaller to interact, like with the introverts that you were saying? Like, what do you do with those smaller signings? What do you do? The question was, what do you do with the smaller signings? <laughs> I do the same thing. I show up dressed like this, the smaller <laughs> signings, stuff like that. Um, I met like seven fans at a pizzeria in Portland, Oregon, you know, wearing a cat suit. So um, and that's just because me, because I'm quirky. But I mean, if I maybe if I wasn't comfortable doing that in a smaller setting, I would still do something like maybe sci-fi to maintain my brand because I really don't want to be consistent in that way. But um, I have not appeared um in a professional capacity not wearing a cat suit since um june at this point so <laughs> i've been very consistent about it thank you you're welcome facebook ams what do you <laughs> michael anderley <laughs> I <hear> your chest <laughs> Hey, put it up. Why am I going down? <laughs> hey, Mal, the question is related to Facebook versus AMS. Something was asked earlier. It's like, if you have limited funds, where would you put those funds for people going forward first? I think actually, to be honest, um, if you have limited funds, AMS is a better place to start. The reason why is that um, whenever you're showing ads on AMS, you're, you're, the AMS has only show on book product pages or during book searches. So you're not going to be showing your ads to people who aren't looking for books. Anybody who sees your AMS ad is already a, a person looking for books um, or even looking at a specific book. So you're much less likely to accidentally blow a lot of money on AMS. Facebook, if you're not paying attention, you're not watching your ads, or you, you target poorly, you could blow a lot of dough on Facebook and get nothing um, from that. So it's, 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 a, it's less of a sure thing. So if you do have, um, if you do have, limited funds, AMS is better. The downside to AMS is it doesn't always spend your money. So you're kind of like at the mercy of whatever Amazon's doing or the bids, you know, like like in the fall leading up to Christmas, the, the major trad publishers always dump all sorts of money into Amazon. And um, and you'll find that your, your AMS ads just spend less and less money because the, the trad pub is outbidding you. Um, but on Facebook, you don't have that same problem. You can actually control very well what kind of spend you want to have on Facebook. And you can use Facebook to always drive new sales once you get good at running ads. But I would say if, if you have a limited budget, I would I would do um, AMS first. And then once you have AMS sort of consistently working that for you, then branch out and do Facebook as well. The one thing to keep in mind though, is that AMS ads only show to people while they're looking at books. And think about it, how long, how much time during the day do you spend looking at, I mean, if, at, not as an author, as an author, we're refreshing our books all the time to see what their rank is, but regular people, how much time do you think they're really spending on book pages or running book searches on Amazon? maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes tops a day, how much time they spend on Facebook. So you, you're, you, if you wanna capture people while they're doing other things, Facebook is the way to do that. If you wanna compete with everybody else running AMS ads while people are on Amazon, then you do that. But, um, but li like I said, limited budget, I would start with AMS. And then as you get better, as you get that nail, branch out to Facebook. Three minutes left. What else do we have? Questions? Questions? No. We all had advertising questions. He wrote the book or two of them. <laughs> <laughs> on some Greg. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in late at yeah. night, Boston time. So uh, thanks a lot, Mal. Let's hear a big uh, yeah. round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Feel free to reach out to me on Facebook as well. And this will be. This is. Uh, we did this Facebook Live, so. It is on 20 books to 50 K. It'll be uh, memorialized there. We'll upload it to YouTube. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your expertise. And I remember uh, 2017 where you did indeed upload a book uh, whilst uh, during a panel. Of the, uh, yeah. yeah.
Yeah, well I'm done. Glad. Thank you. Right. You have a great evening. All right, see you guys. Bye bye. Later. Yep, this is me. This is how I think. <laughs> oh,